Welcome, everybody. Um, I see you are all joining us today from around the world. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you all to this German Center for Research and Innovation New York Zeitgeist webinar entitled Building Bridges via Internationalization of Medical Education. My name is Dr. Jan Nudert. I am the head of programs at the German Center for Research and Innovation New York. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, invite today a number of scholars from the medical profession who will enlighten us on all questions of thinking of using an internationalized approach to your medical education. With us today are Dr. Annette Wu from Columbia University, as well as Professor Dr. Heike Kielstein from Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg in Germany, as well as a number of alumni from the internationalization uh, program ICEP. Uh, if you are interested in more uh, projects like this, events like this, we invite you all to sign up for the German Center for Research Innovation New York newsletter. Uh, we are always pleased to welcome new members in our cohort, so please do take a no moment, check out our website. And with that, I would like to hand it over to our esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. Kielstein, Dr. Wu and all the other medical residents. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lüdert, Jan, for inviting us and for allowing us to speak about internationalization of medical education and how this can help building bridges across nations. Now, let me share my screen. Can you see this? Okay, perfect. All right. So welcome everyone to um, this webinar. Um, so today um, this webinar will take um, you into a different uh, view on medical education and internationalization of medical education, which is a relatively new field. Um, the, the talk today is divided into four parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the concepts and formats and the theories behind internationalization of medical education. And then I will present a, a, an example of an internationalization of medical education program at Columbia University that has a worldwide partners. And um, this will be followed by a talk by uh, Dean Heike Kielstein from Halle Wittenberg, who was the first partner in this consortium. And then we finish off with a student and past participant panel, which I think will enlighten us a little bit what this program and what internationalization of medical education can mean to our students, and that is really the goal of why we're doing this. So the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated and emphasized the importance of transnational connectivity to collaborate on healthcare issues globally. Internationalization of medical education can play a crucial role in preparing our graduates for transformative work transcending national borders. I'm trying to, oh yeah. But what exactly is internationalization of medical education? So we created a little poll for you to ask, um, what is internationalization of medical education? And so maybe you take a minute and respond to the poll. When it shows up, okay, great. Okay, do we have a, do we have the results yet? You're at 20 votes. We'll leave it on for a little bit longer. Okay, great. You can also just guess, which most people do, <laughs> because it is a new field. Okay, David, do you want to share with us the results? The, the results are pretty clear. Um, it's all of the above. That's all, wonderful. All, all factors uh, that I mentioned, um, people are on the same opinion here. Yes, so this is exactly what it is. Um, so somehow my... Oh, here we go. 
Yes, so you are right. The term internationalization of medical education is derived from the social sciences, from internationalization of higher education, IHE. The American Council on Education, ACE, defines comprehensive internationalization in higher education as a strategic coordinated framework that integrates policies, programs, initiatives, and individuals to make colleges and universities more globally oriented and internationally connected. Somehow it is there. I said also delay with my slides here, so, so I apologize if it goes a little slower. The, um, the definition of internationalization of medical education, we adapted this um, definition a little bit and called it the process of purposefully integrating international, intercultural, or global dimensions into medical education in order to enhance its quality and prepare all graduates for professional practice in a globalized world. And we had edited this together with uh, Betty Lesk and Hans de Witt and myself and Edward Choi a few years ago when we started working more in this area. So the term internationalization of medical education currently is not agreed upon in medical education. It is a relatively new area, as I mentioned, in medical education research and practice. And most importantly, it is not a goal or content. It describes programmatic efforts and also um, includes the research of the concepts and the formats and outcomes. So there are literally two dimensions to it. One is the programmatic activities in medical education, but also very importantly, the research and theories that supports these activities. For instance, we need to um, determine the competencies and common goals, and definitely we need outcomes research, particularly longitudinally, and what impact this has on the health outcomes worldwide. It is related to, but should not be equated to um, global health education, um, as we currently understand global health, which is mostly limited to work in the uh, low and middle income countries, but internationalization of medical education would like to see the impact on everyone in the world. Now, what drives internationalization of medical education? The motivation in IHE are determined by constantly changing political, economic, social, cultural, and academic influences and rationales. Laurie Hansen in 2015 described three models of, for IHE, which um, myself, Hans de Witt, Betty Lesk, and Edward Choi in 2020 adapted to internationalization of medical education. They are basically three models. One is called the market model, the social transformation model, and the third one is the liberal model. And as you can see, they all sort of overlap, but I want to look at each of them individually so you can um, appreciate what they all mean. Let's look at the market model first. In the market model, countries, institutions, and universities compete for world ranking in science and clinical care and healthcare in general. It, they also compete for students, for the best students, and it's also a competition between students, um, who gets the better job and who gets a better CV. It is often prevalent in the low and middle income countries. There are certain advantages to it in, in that it has an immediate and measurable success, right? In the following years after an IOME um, that is driven by the market model, you can see um, the higher world ranking in science and then the school is very happy. And this is also often supported with resources from leadership from the top-down approach, meaning there will be always funds or support. And, but there's certainly a disadvantage to the market model. It is definitely not sustainable. Right? Once a milestone is reached, certain countries, institutions, or universities will lose their uh, interest in internationalization. Collaborators can become competitors, and we see it a little bit now with the United States and China, that former collaborators now start to compete against each other. It can ultimately lead to an inward thinking and risk of leading to healthcare nationalism, something that we as global medical educators certainly do not want. And lastly, it is often geared towards the Western values and models. Right, with very little input from the needs of the global south. Um, for instance, you want to rank very high in cardiovascular disease and research when in, your, in the country of, uh, where this um, research is done, cardiovascular disease might not be predominant. Now let's, let's look at the social transformation model next. In the social transformation model, um, the, basic, basic, sorry, the basic for that is health equity, social justice, and global health as we understand it in the original definition 
promoting health for all people worldwide. We want to do good, we want to promote health, and it is most prevalent in the high-income countries for conducting humanitarian work in the low-income countries. And here again, there is an advantage. We have very fast and measurable successes, right? We, for instance, you set up a vaccination program in a country and a few years later, the um, transmissible, transmissible disease is gone. So it's a very fast and measurable success. And very importantly, the motivation in the social transformation model has its roots in the humanitarian and altruistic values of the medical profession, right? It is in line with what we as physicians would like to do. We want to help others. Unfortunately, the way how it is currently practiced has its disadvantage in that it is not very equitable, right? There's an imbalance of give us and take us, and oftentimes it is not mutually beneficial. We have ethical problems in that, for instance, if we send young medical students to low and middle income countries with very little preparation um, for them, number one, to be culturally unprepared, but also to um, conduct um, procedures or taking care of patients that are not quite prepared yet. Motivation and formats do not align in this model very often because it is not accessible to all. Just think about if we pay a student from a high income country a lot of money to go to a low resource um, country and provide medical care, where while we could have given some money to the low income country directly. It is socially quite unjust. And most importantly, it is not realizing the full potential of what global health means to this country. I'm not saying we should not do it, but currently formats and motivations simply are not matched. Now let's look at the liberal model. The liberal model is promoting international understanding and collaboration. It uses the ambassadorial role of students for international goodwill, for also called soft diplomacy or science diplomacy. For instance, past um, post World War II, it promoted the understanding between nations, for instance, through the Fulbrights and Rhodes Scholarships, and more recently, the Erasmus Scholarships. They share the same mission of international understanding and collaboration. Currently, this model or this motivation is very underreported as a main motivation for internationalization of medical education. It does have advantages. It is very sustainable and it prevents healthcare nationalism. And most importantly, it forms um, a, a global medical community that works on common goals together. The disadvantage, unfortunately, is a very, very long term investment. We won't see any results for quite some time. We won't have really, we have very little or maybe even no measurable successes, and there's no immediate effect on or related um, effects on medicine. In 2022, Hans de Witt and myself um, wrote a letter to the editor, to medical science educator, that the liberal model in internationalization of medical education is an opportunity to reduce healthcare nationalism, and I hope some people have read it. Now, before I move on um, to formats of implementation, if there are any questions, you can certainly put them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, so just wanted to mention that. So levels of implementation for IOME can occur on several levels and can be as high as on a global level, for instance, to um, NGOs or any other, other overarching entities. It can be governments and countries, institutions, universities, faculty and student level. And let's not forget the private sector. In the very recent years, companies have now began selling internationalization of medical education sections to students to go abroad to conduct research or to conduct clinical services. And these private sector companies are not under the auspices of universities or medical education. And we really need to be aware that the there is no quality control or no um, um, oversight here. Let's move on to formats of IOME. Um, the American Council of Education points out three areas that we have adapted to IOME. Number one are partnerships. The second would be internationalization of the curriculum, primarily at home, and student mobility. Let's start off with partnerships. International partnerships can be like similar to um, the implementation on several levels, can be between countries or between institutions or between groups. Ideally, they should be multilateral. However, reports that our research has shown is that the partnerships are often one-sided. 
Mostly we find reports from the global north that reports of partnerships with the global south. The literature predominantly is in Anglo-Saxon journals and has a very limited scope. The next area would be student mobility. And here we can divide between inbound mobility and outbound mobility. Let's look at inbound mobility first. If for inbound mobility, these are international students, degree students who come to a country to study. There is very limited reporting in the global literature and primarily from the global north. And it's often not subject of educational research. So there is no longitudinal observation what happens to these students and what they have learned and what advantages they had, what troubles they had. Um, it seems to be not very of the interest of, of um, authors to publish on this. And there's certainly an ethical component, for instance, tuition in many Anglo-Saxon medical schools in the United States or United Kingdom, we charge quite high medical uh, tuition, medical school tuition fees to the students who come often from the low and middle income countries. And secondly, the second ethical problem is the workforce shifting. Sometimes the students do not go back home uh, to provide care for the patients in their home countries, but remain in the host countries or emigrate to other countries. And it creates a brain drain of the, on, on the home countries. In terms of outbound mobility, this is the very common and most common format that we found in the literature in the global north. It is currently the majority of current publications, oftentimes reported one-sided from a medical school or several medical schools in the global north, partnering with schools in the global south. As I mentioned, it is socially unjust and it's not accessible to all because only privileged institutions can offer this to the students and only privileged students of these privileged institutions are able to go. And it's not often just the socioeconomic backgrounds that prevent students from going, but other students, for instance, students with family obligations, with little children, or students with physical disabilities, or students in the military who need to go for training, just cannot travel abroad during medical school. In 2021, um, Betty Lask, Jeff Noel, and Hans DeWitt had written an article to, in Academic Medicine that we find it is time for the internationalization of medical education to be at home and accessible to all. And that brings us to the topic of IUME curriculum at home. What exactly is that? IUME at home is, so Berlin and Jones in 2015, this is the description for international higher education, but it can certainly be applied to IUME. It's the purposeful integration of international and intercultural dimensions into the formal and informal curriculum for all students within domestic learning environments, and we added without travel. The motivations for that is, is, is a very long list, and it has a lot of um, advantages. Number one, it is very inclusive. It's accessible to all students because most of these activities can be done online or other um, modalities that I will show you on the next slide. It is socially equitable because there's no burden on any host. It increases diversity on the campus through diversifying the curriculum. It is also climate neutral in this day and age. We also need to think about the carbon footprint if we begin sending every medical student around the world to internationalize the education, we have a major footprint issue. It is very cost efficient, obviously, and it is sustainable. And in this day and age, when we have um, dealt just with major pandemics or with ongoing wars and political conflicts, as we see them now around the world, they actually save um, and predictable. How can IOME at home be implemented? So we have decided to split them into two areas. One is campus internationalization and the other one is curricular content. Campus internationalization can be further include, uh, divided into faculty exchanges or faculty lectures or exchanges of teaching material, but also student activities and non-degree visiting students who in, um, diversify the student body on the campus. For curricular content, and I'm going to show you on the next slide, they are either integrated international, what we call soft skills or knowledge skills. This slide was put together by myself and together with Alexander Preka. This was more geared towards leadership competencies, but it can be certainly applied to general international competencies. We divide them into specialized knowledge skills and to soft skills, integrated skills. In the knowledge side, we need to look at politics such as health policy, health economics, health law, health ethics, which are different in different countries, certainly. And then public health, 
public health education, health, health delivery and insurance systems, and public health challenges in different countries. And there are also societal differences that students need to be aware of. What is the population demographic, the social determinants of health in certain populations and countries, the status of physicians or the identity of healthcare professionals. And certainly the history of medicine in different countries is different and we ought to be careful and sensitive about how medicine developed in certain countries before we make any judgments when we collaborate. And then language skills is also a knowledge skill. In terms of soft skills or integrated skills, we certainly in the very forefront is the multiculturalism, the sensitivity to different cultures, developing respect and humility, and something what I call decentering is to shift your worldview, so making your own worldview not the center of the world, but also to be tolerant and accepting of other people's views. And finally, communication skills in terms of customs, but also learning how to listen to non-native speakers or um, to other customs and develop the empathy and tolerance. Now, what are the actions for IOME in the future? We, this field, as I mentioned, is new and is relatively small. We, have, we need to de de, um, define common visions and goals and agreed upon definitions and terms, and we need to share our concepts. And very, very important, we need to study outcomes. What, do we, what have we achieved with IOME? Is the world a better place for healthcare once we inter internationalize medical education? I'm the co-editor of a special collection in BMC Medical Education on internationalization of medical education. We need to publish our research, and I think it is extremely important if you don't choose this journal, certainly other journals, but IOME must be published, must be shared with others, so we can be efficiently work together. So in summary of this first block of this talk, um, IOME are formats and processes for internationalization and not a new subject matter to be taught in medical schools. Um, we should not equate this with a common understanding of global health education, which is mostly focusing on the low and middle income countries. And it can be implemented on different levels. Efforts should be analyzed through the lens of different motivation models and formats as outlined by the ACE, the American Council of Education. IOME at home is accessible to all and is socially just and should be widely offered. And the liberal motivation model can lead to collaboration, lessen healthcare nationalism, and ultimately improve the health of all people globally. It, IOME needs to be implemented on a larger and global scale, and definitely we need more reporting on outcomes research. When I scan articles or review articles, it seems to be sometimes I'm the only person who, who is publishing on this, and really this is something that affects us all, and we should all publish about this collectively or collaboratively. All right, here are some references on my work on IOME, but they're, um, they're missing a lot of you, um, your work as well. And so we're going to continue with another poll before I turn over to present the ISEP program or the Columbia ISEP to you. Um, and this poll is, have you had experience with IOME and what was your main motivation? Give you a minute. I see responses are still trickling in. That's great. And I'm pleased to see that so many have seen the liberal model as, as a sustainable model for IOME. Great. Um, okay. So I'm going to now move on to the, and unless there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. This is more an interactive webinar than anything else, but if you listen, we also have a panel at the end. Um, if not, and you can always, um, we can always interrupt what I have to say and go back. I want to present an example of an IOME hybrid at home model, and that is the International Collaboration and Exchange Program, Preparing Global Leaders for Healthcare, or shortly in short, Columbia ISEP. This is our website and our QR code, and this is our logo, which um, represents a lot what uh, we try to do, international multilateral connections. We are Annette, a partnership Annette, now. I'm sorry? We, we have one question from the audience. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, Joanne, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, hi, Annette. <laughs> Annette. Um, I just wanted yeah, to mention um, something that I thought might be interesting to the 
audience, including you, there's a journal called the Journal of Medical Insight. Um, it's a surgical journal publishing high definition peer reviewed video articles for surgeons, physicians, and other medical professionals. And I just thought that'd be interesting. I mean, they're doing those so that people around the world can watch people doing surgery who might not have access to, to learning surgery, but can actually watch others do it. So just wanted to mention that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, there's some one of the goals we hope to do one day. Um, and I will explain a little bit during this portion of the talk now with them. Um, teaching material changes, which I think should be one of the things that um, must be our priority. Um, if we want to really improve health of all people, we need to share. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. So, so our partners, we are 26 universities currently, leading universities around the world, and these are the logos. Um, but most importantly, I want to share the geographic regions. We are on 17 geographic regions in five continents. And as you can see, the majority of medical schools are in North America, East Asia and Europe, but the student body um, in these different medical schools go way beyond these geographic regions. For instance, in the United Kingdom at Cambridge and London, many of our students are from Southeast Asia. We have our students, our partners in Germany and in um, Austria. We have many students from Eastern Europe. We had students from Russia and Ukraine, Romania, Poland and Hungary in the past and currently. And in our partners at the University of Paris, we have many students from Northern Africa and the Middle East. Um, and then we have our classic immigration countries in Canada and the United States and Australia. So the diversity of the student bodies is quite diverse and it really enriches the students' educational um, experiences. Now, what is the mission of ICEP? The mission of ICEP is based on the liberal model. And in 2020, um, in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the program is a lot older, but I had written an article in University World News that the future of our global healthcare world lies in the international collaborative competencies of the next generation of healthcare leaders. And, and that really sums it up what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to prepare our next generation to solve healthcare issues in an international, interdisciplinary, collaborative and mutually respectful and culturally competent manner. We do this through virtual, early virtual international peer and faculty exchanges and structured online programming. A few facts about this program. We were founded in 2014, and you will hear very soon from our esteemed first partner in Halle-Wittenberg. Um, we were founded through the anatomy department um, at Columbia University and oddly in the anatomy department, but it's not that oddly if you think about it. Anatomy is a subject matter that is taught throughout the entire world. Every medical student in the world needs to study anatomy. Anatomists are tightly involved with education. I would say maybe 99% of anatomy professors are teachers. Um, we love our students. And we teach anatomy relatively early, so there's enough time for students to connect and to remain in contact. And it's a great um, binding element because we, we work with dead bodies or dead patients and that the, the experiences with death and dying is is quite profound in our young student population. So we use anatomy as a baseline. However, while it's based in the anatomy departments, the educational content within ICEP goes beyond anatomy. We go into public and global health. Um, we talk about international health ethics, health law, and we also now include the social sciences. We have about 420 to probably up to 450 students per year from all schools and the partnership currently is by a vetting process through our advisory board and by invitation only. We also now expanded into an interdisciplinary um, format rather than just having medical students. We always had dental students, but now we're including biomedical science students and I'll show you a slide in a little bit. And we are hybrid. We were at home even before COVID, long before. We were on Zoom way before everyone else in the world um, started connecting via Zoom. And we have limited travel opportunities for our students to limit our covered footprint. We're multilateral and we have multidirectional academic immersion opportunities for our students. They can go for research travels. And we also have host activities on campus to internationalize the campus. The research opportunities for our students are focusing initially only on the basic sciences, but more recently we have included the social sciences and international public health. And we also do educational research for our students where we put them into international team working groups, which is quite popular. So these are the interdisciplinary disciplines that we accept in the program. We have um, 
um, medicine, primarily in dentistry, but also we included our very youngest. These are the pre-medical students in the post-grad programs where students have to go through a college system first. Um, when students decide to go to medical school, we already accept them. And then public health, health science, biomedical science, pharmacy, nursing, and some other atomical sciences students as well. These are the student participants by the years. We have kept increasing. Even COVID didn't um, give us a dent. So these are the program elements, and it is a little complicated, and I'd like to walk you through. So we have a pre-medical college portion, and then a pre-clinical medical um, portion, and a clinical elective where we teach about nutrition, culture, and planetary health. And we will plan a postgraduate training when students, after they graduate, we also want to internationalize their postgraduate training in the very near future. We have a very active faculty exchange. We're doing faculty research projects already. Um, we want to exchange, or we have started exchanges of teaching material, and um, Heike and um, Columbia had done the very first um, pilot of the teaching material exchange. Um, we also want to, our very near future, we, we started already a pilot with anatomy professor exchanges. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the preclinical medical portion of ISEP. That's the oldest and the longest program we have had. There is a fall program and a summer program. And uh, the next slide now shows you a little bit of the preclinical fall program. It goes from October to October. It's a little confusing, this slide, I apologize. Um, we put students into small groups of five to six, one from each continent at the very least, but all from different schools. And we give them different modules and different block topics to discuss. They meet only once a month, but the cultural experience and the results we achieved from our studies shows that it's sufficient. Um, once a month, the students, in addition, meet with um, as a global um, social weekend um, with with their peers, but also for faculty lectures, um, which I will show you in a bit what we uh, what we cover. We have student debates and breakout rooms and games, the virtual city tours and cultural exchanges. And the students remain on social media platforms to um, remain in contact throughout the program. There are group assignments. Um, in the past, it was a mandatory a paper, but now we move to an optional poster um, that students can submit for a poster competition. And students submit their peer teamwork evaluation, which um, is done with my colleague at King's College, Dr. Gil Sagu. Um, the program ends with a student conference in May. Um, and then we move on to the summer portion, which is from June to October, which there is another slide I will show you what de that details the, the summer activities within ISEP. These are the element blocks, um, and you can see they are really wide range and not just anatomy. We started with anatomy and the topic of death and the reflection um, on death, which is a great cultural um, um, segue to talk about culture because death and funeral services and memorial services are all done very, very differently in different countries. And so the students really learn a lot. And let's not forget the majority of our students are in their late teens and early 20s. So the topic of death is very foreign to them. And just to talk about is, is, is very enriching for them. We move on to health education and delivery and also history of medicine. And then global and public health challenges and health law and health ethics. These are the speakers. And you can see this is a very small print, but I couldn't fit everyone <laughs> into one. Um, slide. Otherwise, um, we invite world experts in their fields for um, because we really think these are the best students selected from the best universities. They need to hear from the best teachers, and so we had, for instance, um, the um, the head or the yeah the leading author of the Eat Lancet Commission talking about nutrition, Professor Walter Willard from Harvard University, or this month Dean um, Linda Fried and her colleague um, John Wong from um, the um, Singapore um, will talk about aging. These bo they both have written the um, uh, commission report on healthy aging um, um, for the National Academy of, Sci of Medicine. And we also had the um, then former vice president, now the prime minister of Taiwan, speaking about COVID-19 and how he, as an epidemiologist, led Taiwan through a very um, successful avoidance of COVID-19 in Taiwan. And certainly the other speakers you will see is a very wide ranging topics, uh, but also a wide range, uh, wide range of different um, medical schools. We had the Dean of the School of Public Health at Yale speaking about climate and health, for instance, but also um, we also had uh, our colleagues at King's College talking about mental health and stress in students. 
Now to the summer and travel opportunities within ICEP. We do offer several options. Well, number one is the research exchanges. The students can, select students, can go for eight weeks to any of the partner universities and conduct basic sciences research. But more recently, we also included topics of the social sciences where they can um, learn about other countries' uh, health um, policy issues or challenges. Um, and they also meet their, their, their peers who are um, hosting them. We also have a virtual summer program, which is um, online only for students who cannot travel. And um, we usually it's a theme. Um, this year we want to do international medical education. Um, and then we have thesis work, which is very interesting and very popular for students. We'll, you will hear from some of them in the second or the fourth portion of this talk. Um, for students in Germany and Austria and UK, they can complete their master's or PhD for an intercalate or an intercalated year for 12 months in the either the United States or United Kingdom or any of the other countries. And very recently, we also inclu included something which is we call the Academic Immersion Short-Term Program, the AIT, which was initiated by the students at the University of Paris Cité this year. And so a group of students, about 100, so it's about the fourth of the, of the court, went to Paris for an academic emergence where they visited um, the University of Paris Cité, but also um, Columbia's Global Center and also uh, the NECA Research Institute. The program, we have written the program in Annals of Global Health, it was published, and uh, it is important that we share these informations and share these experiences with others so others can learn from it and don't have to start from scratch each time. Um, we measured outcomes. Um, we did global comparisons on Dojo competency. We have papers now in um, manuscript form drafts um, that we submit on, on the learning, on validated tests and cultural competency learning um, through this program. But also we have published papers on reflection on the topic of death in different countries. And then certainly um, several of us had written about internationalization of medical education, including interdisciplinary. We worked with the Boston College for the Center for International Higher Education um, on um, internationalization of medical education. Um, through the international higher education side. So what is the vision for ISAP? Where are we going from here? We can envision this as a one-stop feeder system for global healthcare leadership. Um, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel for different medical schools. We can start off with a pre-medical school arm, move on to the preclinical arm, then to the clinical arm, and then faculty and postgraduate collaboration and workforce exchange, and hopefully we'll end up under the auspices of a larger NGO and, and serve as a one-stop focus point for international activities in medical education on any level. So we, do, we don't want to take away individual schools' um, activities on the international platform, but we see ourselves rather than a consortium of medical schools who join with their individual networks, and they're all different, um, and we bring them on they, they bring them all to ICEP and ICEP shares these platforms and networks with, with the other partners. So each partner doesn't partner with one program, they partner with 26 or hopefully in the very near future to, with 30 other partners. And that is very, very enriching. Um, it doesn't um, confuse people, oh, where do I have to apply if I want to go abroad or where do I do my research? Um, you just have to apply to ICEP and then we connect with everyone around the world. And this is for the betterment of the health of all people worldwide um, through the liberal model of internationalization of medical education. With that, I'm going to play a little testimonial from the um, trip to Paris that was just, I think, three weeks ago. So hopefully it'll work. And this is one of our students, Bri Zhang, one of our students from Colombia who went there and was very excited and happy. So she made this little video. Welcome to Paris. This March, medical and dental students from ICEP gathered in Paris for an academic immersion trip. At the Columbia Global Center, we attended a lecture on nutrition, followed by a debate on the government's role in subsidizing healthy eating. At the University of Paris, we learned about the French medical education system and new innovations, while dental students had a special exchange with Dr. Nathan Moreau. At the Museum of History of Medicine, we witnessed over 1,500 historical medical instruments and objects dating back to the 1700s. At the Necker Institute, the birthplace of the stethoscope, we immersed ourselves in the lives of different principal investigators, from hematological cancers to diabetes metabolism. But this trip was so much more than academics. It was getting to know the students. 
while picnicking at the Luxembourg Garden, climbing the steps of Montmartre, or boating on the Seine River. I learned about the cultural phrases, daily pleasures, and future passions of medical students around the world, from Italy to Japan to the UK to France to Singapore and beyond. Over dinner or coffee, our conversations ranged from healthcare policy to love lives to music tastes. The best education comes from real experiences, and the best language is spoken in compassion to learn. Thank you, Isa. Au revoir, Paris. Welcome to Paris. Yeah, there are more testimonials on our website if you want to um, read them. So I posted some of them here's a the QR code if you want to look them up. And then one thing I really want to point out, ISEP is not a funded program, right? We're unfunded, so everyone is doing this in their own time um, and in their spare time. So I really want to thank the faculty members from around the world particip for participating within ISEP. And here are the names of the professors who work with me closely, and some of us are faculty research group members. Um, and I think they really deserve the applause for um, being part of this and having the vision most of us are anatomy professors to, to join here and to make the lives of our students enrich the lives and the education of our students so much. And last but not least, I want to thank all the students for being part of this without the students and their ideas and um, the energy this program would have not been possible. So I'm going to open up for questions and then I'm going to turn over to Dean Heike Kielstein to talk a little bit about her experiences for, um, from ISEP. I don't think we have any questions. Um, if you still have some questions, as as we mentioned, you can you can write them in the chat or um, lift your hand up uh, your hand up virtually, and then we then you could ask your question. Otherwise, we will go to Heike. We have one. Yep, Bernard Bernard Goodwin. Hi, hi um, Annette. Uh, thank you so much for that um, inspiring talk. Um, I just have a comment about this carbon footprint thing, and I really uh, command you a lot that you are thinking about that. Uh, but I do think that if you're looking at longer stays of students who do a lot of networking with a high impact of their li on their lives, I think we don't have to worry too much about that. You know, if you look at the rest of the lifestyle of these lives, then probably this will be of minor concern. So what we can do is we can enrich a program with you like this Lots, lots of networking beforehand, lots of networking during the stays, lots of networking after the stays, then there's a lot of bang, you know, in the buck you spend on, 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 on carbon uh, emissions. And that's why I really think that it's good thinking about that, but, but we, we really have more impact with this. I think that with ICEP, there's a lot of impact, and that's why I really think it's justified. Yeah, no, I appreciate that you're mentioning. That's why I always said we're hybrid, right? We 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 started off, and Heike will probably um, say more. But we started off as we called us the Skype program. We were never a travel program, and I always tell students this is not a travel placement program. We don't want to be considered as such. But you are absolutely right. The physical interactions are really really worth um, the, the efforts. We won't do it for every student, but for select students who really um, stand out as leaders. Um, within their schools or within the program. And um, I think the trip to Paris and more recently we went to a conference where several of these students had worked online for about a year. They never met in person, but you met them together and they met, it's the first time they met each other after one year and you thought they had known each other for years, right? They were inseparable, they were staying in the same hotel room and it, it was very um, heartwarming to see that that an online program can really co create these connections and make students be such close friends. And the reason why we do this so early in medical school is when you are in your early 20s or late teens, these friendships will last forever. So hopefully one day um, when something like COVID happens again, hopefully not, but we will unfortunately see something like that again, or even other healthcare issues, they can just pick up their phones and they, they text each other, they don't call each other anymore, right? So they text each other and say, hey, how do you do this in Sydney? How do you do this in London? How is it done in Nairobi? Let's all work together. And this, this community feeling, um, I felt very much when I ever see these students come together. So you're absolutely right. 
a portion should be done in person, but the major portion, the most of the work should be done longitudinally online. And we also are different from other exchange programs in that it's not just a one time sending students off for two months to another country. So it's a long term commitment for students to remain part of ISAP. And several of them that I met in Paris really want to um, continue building the ISAP chapters in their countries, not just for the school, but for their countries and making sure that these chapters really communicate with each other. And our logo, which was um, created by one of our students from Paris, Sophia, um, really shows us what how the future of ISAP can look like, right? So all these chapters communicate, everyone is connected with each other and they feel they're part of this community. And we call them the global classmates, right? So these are not classmates from just when your class, but global classmates. We have one more question from Joanne first, and then we have a question from the chat from Mohamed. Uh, Joanne, do you want to go first? You are still muted. Thank you, Annette, for the excellent presentation. Um, I just have a question about when they, those who go abroad, when they come back, I mean, how are you utilizing their knowledge and skills as ambassadors to, you know, I mean, I think it, it's very really rewarding for people when they come back from study abroad or from working abroad to be able to use those, that knowledge and skill that they've acquired to, you know, help others. What, to what extent are you using that or, or have you thought about doing that? Um, yeah, we will hear in a few minutes um, from from some of them that have returned and because our program is relatively old, some of them have been abroad last or uh, six years ago. Um, but I do get um, emails, even though these students graduate and so oftentimes I don't see much of them. I'm a preclinical educator, so I don't really see them when they go into their clinical years. I get emails and photos years later from someone sitting in, in, in Kyoto having dinner with someone and they say, oh, I, I just met with my friend that I met six years ago in medical school through the ISA program or someone sits on the Empire State Building. So these connections are certainly there. What we are not old enough to measure the outcome on medicine at this point because the students are all in residency or the participants are still in residency. So hopefully in the next 10 years. And that's why I think it is so important to have the longitudinal observations and the outcomes research that so few of us publish to make sure that these internationalization programs really have an impact on medicine longitudinally and, and what kind of impact and how do we tweak this type of programming so we can make a much faster and more, more, um, more a greater impact on medicine and health collaboration. Thank you. Um, we have one more question. I'm going to pass it on from the chat from uh, Mohamed from Kenya. He is a fifth year uh, medical student in, in Kenya, and he was wondering how he could participate in the, in the program. Um, yeah, so currently we're still by invitation only. Luckily, he's at a school that we had recently invited. So hopefully his school will be part of it. Um, the advisory board, which I actually I see Dr. Hardy here, he's part of the advisory board. Um, there are five members of, of different professions and different universities who um, most of us are not, or most of the advisory board is not part of ISEP. Dr. Hardy is the exception. Um, and so we review these, um, these applications very carefully. I spent a lot of time going online and talking to people, who, who, which there's a whole list of uh, um, um, criteria that we need to fulfill before a, a program becomes a partner. So the answer for Mohammed, he's lucky his, his school is actually part of the program already. Thank you so much. Anybody else? No? Okay, great. Then uh, let's continue. Jan, go ahead. I, I have uh, one uh, comment more. Uh, Annette and uh, some others who are on the call, you all recall the work by uh, Schulman at uh, Stanford on signature pedagogies in various professions. I think what's really interesting about the international model is how it helps medical students appreciate both the common structure of medical education across the globe, but also their specificities and the habituations that come from various uh, geographical locales. And I think that in and of itself, I think is something that Annette, you and I, uh, I hope we can touch up on, especially on the science diplomacy publication uh, piece, because it is something that I'm really curious also to hear uh, from some of the students on what the experience with that difference and similarities in the educational models has been and how it's impacting their, their journey through residency and beyond. That, that's fantastic. You, are, you have the right people listening. <laughs> 
No, that's great. No, I'm definitely I'm open to any further research or any publications because we need to publish this area because this is so little, um, there's so little known currently. So I think, uh, David, do you want to turn over the microphone to Heike? Yes, we can do that. Okay, so I will start. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for organizing this um, amazing meeting and for inviting me as one representative of the participating 26 um, universities. Um, and I, I just want to say that Annette is really the founder of the ISAP program. This is our creative spirit. Um, and it's so amazing to see her um, arranging all these uh, new lines of the of the program. Um, um, it's, 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 it's really an, an amazing, amazing person, um, Annette Wu. Um, so I was um, one of the first, um, I was the first <laughs> um, um, faculty member of one German university. Um, and it is um, great to see the, 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 the growing um, of this program. So I'm working at Martin Luther University in um, Halle in Eastern Germany. And um, my institute, the Institute of Anatomy and Cell Biology, um, has a long history. So um, in the year 152, uh, the medical faculty was one of the founding faculties of the Martin Luther University, and there are lots of famous anatomists working um, in this institute. Um, in these times, in the 1670s um, 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 century, um, collaborations with, with foreign university and, and research institutes were numerous. However, um, in the GDR, so the German Democratic Republic times, um, the international ex exchange um, was completely disrupted. Um, and, and this is our history. Um, and so it was a very special moment that this university was the first university um, getting part of this Skype program, this ISAP program. So after the German reunifi reunification, this is more than 30 years ago, um, um, the, um, so the novel international partnerships were established and nowadays we have more than 99 um, partner universities spread all over the world. Um, and um, we have lots of scientists, students coming to our university for for joint research proje projects and so on. Um, I was very happy that this, my anatomy institute was the first, um, um, first partner and we started the program with an um, Skype sessions. So we also had three um, sessions, I think um, these days, but we also exchanged the um, American dissector so this was a script to dissect uh, human bodies. And um, Annette Wu and um, um, Professor Byrne, they, they, they um, had these script, these um, e-learning um, tool. Um, and we tried to, to um, dissect the German human bodies with the script. And this was very interesting. It worked very good. Um, but the next year, um, Annette had lots of new ideas and the program yeah um just um, um changed a little bit and is now a, a really great exchange program on a virtual base at least so for my faculty a uh, former gdr faculty this is very a meaningful step um not only for the development of medical education but also reflects uh, the progressive nature of this project. Um, and um, the aim of this project was to combine um, traditional concept of dissection course and talking about um, um, the curricula 
um, with the modern idea of internationalization of medical education, as Annette mentioned in her great talk. Um, and in a school that had a history of isolation, I must state it like this, um, for several decades in the past, it, is of, it, was, very, um, it was very important. Um, for us, the, the um, objective of the I, um, ISAP, the formation of a transatlantic, of a multilateral um, collaboration of different um, universities, um, and um, with my former EDR um, university, with an American Ivy League university, it is not a university like <laughs> a normal university, it is an Ivy League university, um, I think it was successful for us. Um, so we aim to raise students' awareness for the importance of being interconnected with each other and informed about different approaches to the cu curriculum, different approaches to medical education and exchange of knowledge um, and experience. And um, um, furthermore, the foundation of an international collaboration between um, two or now more um, medical schools has really successfully initiated um, and led to further um, projects here in, in my university for um, an international exchange. So um, I'm very thankful, um, not for, for me, but for the students here. Um, and they really like this, this program very much. And, and um, there are um, at least um, 20 students, 15 to 20 students, um, in this program every year and they are waiting um, when the new program starts and they are asking when can I get in this uh, amazing program. So yeah, that's um, my point of view of this, um, this experience. Yeah, almost 10 years ago, we started this, this great program. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so are there any questions? So there are um, some students from Germany and also um, in, the, in the panel, there will be uh, Carlos. It's so nice to see you, Carlos. <laughs> Carlos stayed for several weeks at Halle University and it was uh, really, really get, great to get in contact with you. <laughs> Should we shift to the student panel? Um, I, I know we have a few participants, past participants who are in residency, so I really don't want to um, make sure that their time is is, um, mm -hmm. is wise, wisely used. Maybe we should start with Dr. Galvez. Um, so, um, so Dr. Galvez, um, you can introduce yourself maybe quickly and then share your experiences from your ICEP travels and to what extent, and it goes a little bit towards what Dr. Lüdert had just said, to what extent has this experience contributed to your career so far and your international understanding between nations? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I am Dr. Carlos Galvez and I graduated from Columbia University College of Dental Medicine back in 2022, not so long ago. And now I'm finishing my first of the two years residency at Washington Hospital Center in Washington, DC. And it's a hospital affiliated with Georgetown University. And I'm working on becoming an orthodontist. And uh, I had the opportunity, the pleasure, and the privilege to travel to Halle in Germany and work with Dr. Heike, who just thought, uh, was just talking. And uh, I cannot believe it's been almost four years since um, I went because it feels like yesterday. And that's how much it impacted my life in a very positive way. Um, at the professional level, interacting with professionals within the same medical field in different you know, places, different universities, countries around the world is just so healthy for creating perspective about our own educational process. And you know, seeing firsthand how other students learn and how they work on their labs and how their, you know, their work ethics and the challenges they have. And you end up applying all of that you learn to your own learning process. So I got the opportunity to go over the dental school as well 
and see how they learn and practice dentistry. So that was very connected to my education. And um, I created friendships even, you know, at the dental school that I still keep in touch with to this day. Um, I was part of the project. Uh, it was a re case report project, uh, which was perfect for me. Uh, but also I had the opportunity to work with uh, other projects within Dr. Heike's lab in the anatomy institute. So that was amazing for me. Um, now, from the interpersonal perspective, I really love getting to know medical and dental students and faculty abroad and learning about their day-to-day uh, day -day life outside of dental school or medical school and enjoy learning about the German culture and their traditions. And I, you know, I love the city of Hala and I went to museums, went to festivals. That's, you know, I really enjoy my travels outside the work. It's, it's not just work, like Dr. Wu was saying, you know, you work a lot, but then you also enjoy um, everything else that uh, comes with it. And I went to museums, you name it, festivals, uh, it, the silly, you know, everything was really, really nice. Um, I, I really enjoy my time in general, and I, I grew up so much as a person that it's something that it will stay with me for the rest of my life. I didn't get to learn a lot of German, but it's on my bucket list. So one day if I return to Allah, I have to go back to that cafe in front of the Anatomy Institute and properly order coffee and lunch because I had a, not a good time ordering all the time, but it was really funny. Um, and then just to answer your question about how this contribute to my career, um, I mean, I can expand this in many layers. And I think Dr. Wood, you mentioned that, you know, you really give the opportunity to stu students that otherwise wouldn't have this you know, the opportunity to do it, not only because within the institution, but like, you know, society, um, like, you know, my background, my finance, my, my finance and all of that. So having this opportunity was incredibly amazing to me. And, um, you know, the personal development as a practitioner, the things that I learned uh, when I went abroad, I'm able to apply in my everyday practice today. The way um, I interact with my patients, for example, the way I'm, you know, you're more culturally aware uh, of your patients, it's it's just something that you learn by you know interacting with other cultures in general. So you challenge yourself to many different levels and to know how others are taking care um, or of their patients somewhere else. It's it's just so incredible how you adopt that to the way you treat your patients. Um, uh, another way that I can see this contributing to my career is that um, I was lucky enough to publish, and this is something that is program really emphasizes, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very good publishable, um, uh, you know, projects. And um, for instance, uh, to apply for my residency, which is orthodontist within the dental community, it's, it, it's, it can be a little challenging and competitive and you sort of have to build your resume in a way that, you know, it, it includes, you know, good publishable projects like the one that I, I, I did. And, and I think that really helped me a lot when for my application process, because, you know, even though my project was not necessarily a dental project, it was so interesting for everybody to know and how I ended up in Germany uh, working in a research lab. So I, I think that really contributed a lot to my um, application process. Um, and lastly, I think, you know, getting to know all of these uh, future doctors and future dentists, um, you know, you keep all these relationships and I still keep in touch with all these um, amazing people that I met abroad. And this is not connections that you stop having. You, this is last, lastly connections and people that I know that I can count on and they can count on me in the future if there's any questions that arise or um, anything that it come up to, um, I guess, in their little day practice. Um, I think this is one of the most important things of this uh, uh, program and I'm so lucky and uh, to be part of it and actually be here today and talking to you guys. I feel forever grateful and I, I, I think Dr. Wu knows that and I'm always here for anything she needs and um, for the program. still muted Annette. oh sorry yeah thank you carlos um it's so wonderful to hear it from you you always said you were going to help but you know to hear it like summarized um from you who were a past participant and 
who has been in the program, I think you traveled four years ago, but the program started for you five years ago when you were a first year dental student at Columbia. So I think it's, um, it's very heartwarming for me, but also I think it's very important for us to hear the perspectives of a US student going to Germany, because typically it's the other way around. We'll hear from a few more, but for US students to go abroad and having this experience is quite significant. I think in the interest of time, and also because I know Dr. Liao is also on the edge of going back to work, maybe we should ask the second participant from Colombia. He's a medical student, but he's a PhD um, already. So his name is Dr. Liao. So jean can I call upon you next with the same questions to share your experience from your ISAP travel? Um, and um, to what extent this experience contributed to your career so far and your international understanding between nations. And maybe just quickly introduce yourself because um, I think your background is a little bit different than um, others in terms of going, getting a PhD first and then get, going to medical school. I thought you meant my little background. I was going to say sorry for the, sorry for the mess. Um, I'm Zen Ray. Um, thank you, Annette, again, also for organizing this fantastic uh, meeting. It's really important to have times like this where we can like talk and reflect um, and talk about our experiences because I think like you know, this is such a cool program and many more people should know about it and be able to participate. Um, so to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm an MD PhD student here at Columbia, uh, which um, for people uh, in other countries, it's a program where you do both a medical degree and a doctorate in basic science in an intercalated fashion. So you do two years of medical school and then um, your PhD and then you finish medical school and then you graduate and uh, have both degrees with the aim of becoming a physician scientist. Um, so uh, I started in 2017, which was kind of in, in an earlier iteration of this program. And uh, I met Annette through the, through the anatomy course, which she very skillfully precepted. Um, and uh, I thought this was a really cool program because like I'd always been interested in healthcare in other countries and also like really enjoyed traveling, like really like languages. And in 2019, the, in the summer before I started my PhD officially, um, I did a research exchange at the LMU in Munich uh, in the lab of Dr. Andreas Kertz, who is a theoretical neuroscientist. Um, in Munich, and I thought it was a really fantastic experience. I was there for about six weeks and uh, got to meet some really cool people uh, working on a project um, that like was very different from what I worked on before. It was like a theoretical, uh, it was like much more similar to theoretical physics uh, than like, you know, hands-on neuroscience. And like a lot of the people there had been trained in theoretical physics, even though their, uh, their projects were nominally in modeling neuroscience systems and i found that a really fascinating uh i found that really fascinating um and munich was also such a beautiful city uh that i'd never been to before like before i had visited berlin like on vacation but having the chance to live in munich for a few weeks and actually like get to know the city um and like uh, meet some people there uh i thought like was really great and i also learned german while uh, while i was there and continued uh, after i returned to the returned to the u.s um I did like notice that there were like a lot of uh, a lot of differences, um, especially I think in terms of the uh, work culture. I think people have a much more uh, humane attitude towards uh, how much you're expected to work and work life balance. Um, maybe that was just Bavaria because it seemed like they had every other you know, every other Friday off uh, with all the Catholic holidays and the German federal holidays. Uh, but I enjoyed that a lot and. I there was a really great sense of community there. Um, I was actually just at a conference two weeks ago and I was like, I got lunch with somebody that I knew uh, that I met there uh, just two weeks ago. We were, we just met up at this conference in Montreal and like, you know, a few months before that I was texting with uh, another one of my friends from uh, that lab and, you know, just like over Facebook. And like uh, before that, like last, last fall, I was at a, uh, at a different conference in San Diego and like met up with two other friends that I had met in my experience uh, there. So it's definitely something that like I think has had a really um, uh, has had a really lasting impact on me. And like these are people that you know I have one friend that I met there who it seems like I'm meeting in a different city every time. Um, and it's been happened like six times now. So it's been like uh, a really great experience. Um, as far as like the impact on my on my future career, 
Um, so I think like as Annette alluded to, I think like being there uh, was part of uh, a decision that I made um, to move my career to Europe eventually uh, after training here in the US. So like um, thinking about moving to uh, Germany eventually after I finished residency or potentially or potentially Switzerland. Um, but I think like uh, it's, it would have been hard for me to you know, have come to this realization or like to make a decision like that in an informed way uh, if I hadn't actually you know, been there and learned the language and met some of the people and now have some of the connections to maybe spend some more time there before like actually like uh, fully making the, the move uh, after, after I trained. So I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity. Thank you for sharing that. I heard um, we also have the other way around. Some of the German students want to move. So we actually created a little bit of a shifting here. But I think for Germans, for US students who wanting to go abroad, this is very rare. Um, we don't really hear that, that often. So I think it's uh, hopefully very enlightening for everyone. Thank you for sharing that, Jenry. Um, we can move on to the um, to the to the students actually who are who are finishing up in, who came to the United States. So we can maybe start with um, Michael, um, who just finished his time um, at Columbia. Um, so maybe you can um, introduce yourself and then ans answer the same questions um, to share your experiences and to what extent this experience contributed to your career so far and your international understanding between nations. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanna thank um, Annette to give me this opportunity to talk here uh, in front of you. And to give you yeah like a brief um or to show you my view um and yeah so my name is uh, michael Kökenritz. i'm a third year medical student from the martin luther university in halle in germany and i participated in the ice program in the year 2020 and 2021 and it gave me the unique opportunity to build bridges and connections um, with other medical students from all around the world and although we all like studied uh, in the same field, in the field of medicine, for me, it was very enriching, I would say, to discuss medical issues, ethics, and also education, and also to listen to, um, yeah, students, medical students with different opinions and also cultural backgrounds on those yeah, very interesting topics and also uh, important topics for every one of us. Um, furthermore, I think the ICE program enabled me to, um, yeah, enabled me to pursue my research stay, which, um, yeah, and as I just mentioned, um, I um, was able to do a one year research stay at the Columbia University to do my um, thesis research. I started in um, May 2022 and now I'm finishing everything up. So I'm right now in my last couple of days here in New York at the Columbia University. And um, I not just could uh, um, do the, my research for my thesis, I also was able to uh, meet other ICE students from all around the world, not just the US, but also from other countries like Spain, the UK, um, Italy, and also Taiwan, and um, that were also traveling with the ICE program, which was really cool for me and really uh, fascinating experience, I think. And um, on the one hand, it was for me also uh, great to get into a new field of medicine, the medical research for me, which was pretty new for me. Um, but also at the same time to explore together with my um, other ICE um, travelers or travel buddies um, and friends, the um, fascinating city like New York. And I think to spend time over the summer um, will keep us all connected around the globe. And I think we will visit soon each other all again. So just um, next week, I'm going back to, to Halle, to Germany. And we like already have set up a meeting there in Halle, which is really great. And also one of my um, friends I met here from Barcelona is now doing his um, Erasmus in Halle. So we will also probably see each other again there, which is really great. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and I think it will keep us all connected. And I think all in all, the ICE program really enriched my personal growth in terms of internationalization, communication, and also exchange. And I think, to my mind, everybody could, um, yeah, profit or like benefit from such a unique experience. And I would also love to see more um, students to be part of such a uh, fascinating program. Um, 
yeah, so I think it's a really um, great program. I'm really thankful for the experience I had so far with it. And I hope that I will also like in the future will um, benefit from it and also um, see more people um, can benefit from it. And besides my personal growth, I think also um, the IC program enabled me to build an international network with medical students from all around the world and also future physicians, I think, to share not just knowledge, but also experiences and also build lasting friendships. And um, the research day I had at Columbia University at the Moore Lab in the um, CCTI, it's the Columbia Center for Translational Immunology, um, showed me a whole new side of medicine and gave me a new perspective on the medical research, definitely. And for me, also kind of a dream came true to work in a, a, yeah, such a like well-known or prestigious uh, research institution like the Columbia University, and also to work in a so international um, research team with people from and scientists from all around the world um, on T cell immunology. And I think it strengthened also my desire to pursue a medical career in an international academic environment. And it showed me also how important um, translational research is and will be for um, yeah, to enhance the medical treatments for patients all around the world. Um, and I think from this experience, I will definitely benefit um, for my uh, whole career and will also shape my career, I think. And I believe that in our globalized world, the big medical challenges laying ahead of us uh, can just be solved with um, this uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and also the strength and collaboration between yeah, future physicians, medical students, and also yeah, medical faculties all around the world. So thank you again um, for this opportunity. Yeah. And if you have any questions, just let me know. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michael. This is uh, really nice. Um, so, you know, he, um, Michael was um, one of the first who came after the pandemic. We, we had to stop our exchanges uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Michael was one of the first ones who came back and he immediately d dove into the work and into the research. I mean, many labs at Columbia and in the United States, or maybe all over the world, had taken a big hit during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was certainly not easy for him to start off doing research in an environment that was still kind of uh, recovering from a very difficult time. So he did a fantastic job adjusting and coming to New York and being brave enough to to dive into this um, into this experience. Well, thank you for sharing, Michael. Um, I think the next live. Um, Person uh, who is online is Luca. Luca is a medical student from the LMO in Munich, um, who is currently still an ISAP exchange student at Columbia. So maybe Luca, do you want to share a little bit um, your experiences so far? Um, you still have a few months ahead of you, but maybe your experience. And she also participated twice in the online version of of, um, of ISAP. So maybe a little bit of uh, that information might be helpful for the audience. Sure. So uh, first of all, I'm very thankful to be on this panel here. It's just so nice to hear everyone's experiences and just to connect again. Um, so I'm Luca. I'm a medical student from the University of Munich in Germany. And uh, yes, I've been doing research here at the Columbia University since October. And I've been uh, participating in the ICE program since um, 2021. So, as Anati said, I've been taking part in two um, fall programs until now and one summer program. And um, I think the ICE travels and also the ICE program um, helped me grow in many different ways. So, um, first of all, I think it was already mentioned, like cultural awareness. So, I've just talked to so many different people from so many different backgrounds, from so many different cultures, and it just exposed me to so many different ways of thinking um, that there's no other way than like exp expanding, um, expanding your cultural awareness. Um, then in addition to this, of, um, of course, professional development. So I've been placed in a foreign country in a lab. I've never really worked in a lab outside from medical school. So um, I was just exposed to so many different research techniques and research technologies. And this just helped me to, to develop new skills and um, I gained so much new knowledge. So. I think that's very, very valuable for uh, our future careers to make these experiences, especially in an international setting. Um, also collaborating with so many international researchers. So for example, my lab, it's, so I'm in the same room as Michael who just presented 
uh, but I'm in a different lab. I'm in the Zorn lab. We also do immunology research. But um, in our lab, we have people from France, we have people from Germany, we have people from Brazil. And it's just so interesting to work with so many different people from so many different countries and backgrounds. So you also somehow have to learn or to develop cross um, cultural communication skills, which I think is very important for us um, considering globalization. And we will have to work with so many different people from different backgrounds in the future. Um, and also, of course, this ha it helped me build um, a network of professional contacts. And these are also very valuable for um, future collaborations. Um, then, of course, like just the exposures to um, different healthcare systems, like in the online programs, we often discuss different healthcare systems, just different medical systems. And it's very interesting to hear from uh, other students from all around the world. But now being here in another country um, for longer than just vacation, um, you also experience the um, healthcare system right firsthand because our lab is directly placed in the hospital. So you just see how everything works. And it's very nice to uh, see that after you spoke to so many different students online and heard from them about their systems. Um, of course, in addition to like the uh, professional development, the personal development. So I think it's just very important for us to uh, become more independent. So I'm still in my early 20s. And of course, in Germany, I've also not been living at home and I'm going to university like I'm by myself. I'm living by myself, but uh, working in a foreign country just requires a certain level of uh, yeah independence and adaptability. So you just have to have to adapt to uh, the changing circumstances. And I think that's very like a very important skill to learn if you want to work in medicine later. Um, yeah, you just have to like navigate the environment, the different cultures, different people. And I think it makes you like grow up very fast in a good way. And of course, I think language skills, we don't have to mention. I think everyone's gonna, uh, yeah, learn new languages if they're in a different country. Um, and then how it's helping me with my career. I mean, I think I don't have to mention that Columbia is like a very prestigious and uh, yeah, highly known university. So of course, it's going to look good on our CV. You meet so many important people um, you can network with. It's very important for future collaborations. And um, yeah, I think it's just broadened my understanding um, of the different healthcare systems. So in the online programs, we had the opportunity in small groups to, as I said, to discuss different topics. And um, I think it's just helping us to be better doctors in the future and have like solid careers because we're just discussing like controversial topics maybe and hearing from perspective from different students from different countries um for example in my small group we did a presentation about aid in dying eutanasia and it was just very interesting because if you're like from a country like germany like you know the rules in germany you maybe know the rules in switzerland just because it's very different to other countries in europe but it was just very interesting to hear about other countries, like maybe the US or how it's done in Spain, et cetera. And uh, I think just um, getting the input of many other different views on things, um, yeah, just helps us with our careers and um, yeah, to work with people in a different way later. And um, yeah, I think it was just, the, the program just very, ha really helps us to, um, yeah, get us, help us get another view on things and, I'm very thankful for this program. And I think the travel part is as important as um, the online part, but in the online part, you just meet much more people, even much more, more people from different countries and hear from more cultures. So I'm very happy that it's a hybrid format and not just the traveling or not just um, the online part. Thank you so much, Luca. This is a great um, summary of your experiences. And I hear a common thread that all these um, connections and the experiences and the growing up and you know particularly those who are of, of us who are <laughs> over 20 right um it, it is very important for someone of your age group luca and, and the other presenters to have these experiences when you're very young because it really forms um your your um your personality and also growing up you, you hear that quite often um some of the students who are were unable to um present today of some of the graduates who are in residency already weren't able to come. Um, they had always told me that this program really helped them to look at different um, views of life. And we even had couples who met 
and got engaged. So it, it is um, sometimes a little bit more than we, we were expecting. But um, it, I think the, the personal interactions are so important and to make you a good doctor. I mean, a part of this, of our profession is very interpersonal, right? And to have these connections, maybe even more important for than for other professions to have the personal connections when we work across globes, uh, across the globe and across um, national borders. I think that's it for the students who had participated in the past or current students. I mean, I see a couple of them. Um, I see Vlad, who is our senior leader for the current fall program. Um, he's from the University of Paris. We have one student who is unable to come. She was probably the very first one. She participated in the program in 2000, I believe, 15 and traveled in 2017. She sent us a video that I hope um, David can um, play for us um, because she's taking her um, state exam, I think, this week. So she was not able to join. Um, so her name is Alexandra. She's from the Martin Luther University of Halle because she was the first cohort to travel. Um, ISAP was initially, when we were Skype, we didn't have any travel opportunities. So she was the very first student. She joined ISAP twice and then went 2017 for the very first time. David, could you play? Ah, oh, here we go. I was one of the first students to travel with the ICE program back in 2017. I think then my motivation was mostly personal. I wanted to have the experience, get to know different students, get to know different medical system. But during 2017 until today, the program has changed and I have changed too. So I think my motivation has changed. Um, I think it's more about social transformation, about inclusion to me. And I'd like to share one moment from the ICE program back in two, 2019. Um, there was a group of students from Helsinki and um, some students from Finland, two girls from Paris and one boy from Japan. And we were all sitting in Central Park in New York. We were all ICE students and we were having a barbecue. And we started talking and realized that we had different nations, different kinds of religions, different skin colors, but it just didn't matter. Everything that mattered was that we were students, we were medical students, we were part of the ICE program and we had something to talk about. And to me, that was one of the most beautiful experiences. Thank you. Well, I think a, a perfect encapsulation of um, this wonderful presentation today. Uh, I want to extend my gratitude one more time to Annette Wu for um, approaching me last year um, to think about this format. Um, and uh, Dr. Krielstein, I also have to say thank you to you. As a East German myself, uh, I had to reminisce about the impact um uh, the fall of the berlin wall had on all of us who had experience had an experience in both sides of germany but i think in general i think what we've all been able to take away today are the tangible as well as the intangible parts of exchange and what that means and i don't think any project uh, could better encapsulate the work of the german center for research and innovation here in new york we are um, interested in supporting transatlantic exchange, exchange between the continents, but also to prepare the next cadre of leaders, uh, whether they are in the medical profession, as all of you are, or in other research fields. Um, we really thank all of you for taking the time today. Um, once again, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have further questions or interested in other programming of our center. Uh, you find us online at dvhnewyork.org. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming around the world. A big hello and großes Dankeschön, and um, we'll see you all in a different capacity. Thank you so much.